You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. Gold, crude oil, corn, soybeans, and more. With so many tradable products, the futures options market can be an intimidating place. How can you possibly keep track of the latest trading developments across so many different products? Don't worry, we've got you covered. Welcome to This Week in Futures Options, the program designed to help active futures options traders stay on top of this ever-changing marketplace. Each week, we'll break down the top trades, hot products, volatility explosions, and much more. This Week in Futures Options streams live, so be sure to check out our live stream via the Mixler app. That's M-I-X-L-R. Or join our live chat room at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. Whether you're an experienced veteran or a newcomer looking to separate the wheat from the lean hogs, this week in Futures Options has the information you can't find anywhere else. This week in Futures Options is brought to you by CME Group the world's leading and most diverse futures and options exchange. For more information and educational resources about futures options at CME Group, visit cmegroup.com slash options. This Week in Futures Options is also brought to you by FTSE Russell, a leading global provider of benchmarks, analytics, and data solutions. For more information, please visit ftserussell.com, cboe.com, and cmegroup.com. Com. And now, get ready to break down the latest futures options trading activity. It's time for This Week in Futures Options. All right, everybody. That music means we are back on Thursday, 1.30 p.m. Central, 2.30 p.m. Eastern, ready to talk some futures options. Yes, it is time for TWIFO. My name is Mark Longo from theoptionsinsider.com, as well as, of course, from the ever scintillating network upon which so many of you are binging these days. Quick reminder, if you're on demand, you like what you hear, keep rating and reviewing. It is more important than ever with these just crazy markets and so many new people discovering the world of options and podcasting together. <laughs> Those ratings, reviews, more than ever are important. So get out there to your platform of choice. Keep rating and reviewing. If you like what you hear, you want to go above and beyond, join us in the secret club for the live streams throughout the week. And, of course, the pro Q&As, options oddities, the giveaways, everything else, theoptionsinsider.com slash secret club is the place to go to learn more. And however you listen live after the fact, keep sending in those questions, those comments, those insights, those pearls of wisdom. We do love to hear from all of you folks out there, and let's see who we're hearing from holding down the FTSE Russell and CME Group hot seats today. We are joined by our old friend, Mr. Russell Rhodes. He's holding court over there at the Kelly School of Business these days, but we like to call him the once future and now present Dr. Vix. Mr. Doctor, welcome back to the program, sir. Mr. Doctor, that's a good way to put it. So happy to be back here from rainy Indiana. Uh, can you hear it in the background? I don't have a window, but I have a skylight in my office. No, I, so I cannot can hear it. Pitter patter. It's supposed to be this crazy blizzard, and we're getting a bunch of rain. So I guess I know so much for the weathermen out there. I was getting warnings two days leading into this. Watch out, something crazy's coming your way, and yeah, just a bunch of rain. So say la vie. Let's hope we can all be more precise in our trading than the weathermen are out there these days. But let's kick it off. You know what time it is, Mister Doctor. It is time 
for the Movers and Shakers Report. It's time to find out what's rallying on the light side and falling to the dark side at CME Group this week. It's time for the Movers and Shakers Report. All right, everybody. Time for the Movers and Shakers, the portion of the show where we break down what is lighting things up to the light side, a.k.a. the upside, and to the dark side this week over there at CME. And it's kind of a weird chart. Quite frankly, this week, you can see it for yourselves if you follow us on social media, if you follow CME, they put it out every week before showtime as well. It's kind of equidistant upside and downside till you get to the top two and the bottom two in each chart. Then it gets just crazy town, I think is the technical term <laughs> out there with a couple of big, actually two, exactly two big movers to the upside and to the downside. But Mr. Rhodes, you are our guest. You get to choose where we begin, where should we start our journey this week, sir, to the light side or to the dark side? I'm, I'm really on the fence on this one, but since uh, to, to go along with the wonderful weather that everybody's experiencing, let's go dark side. All right, dark side it is. To the red we go, listeners. Uh, number five on the dark side cost you 5.07% to break into the top five, or really the bottom five in the dark side this week. That shows you how aggressive of a week it is. Out there, I get you to iron ore. There's a lot of rumors China's really been on the rampage against higher iron ore prices, and we're seeing that play out a little bit again this week, off over 5% this week. Number four, our old friend BTC, aka Bitcoin, was number one to the upside not too long ago. And uh, this week, coming back in at number four, last week it was up almost 24%. It took our top spot to the upside. So any given week, if you guess a handful of names, I've said it before, if you guess Bitcoin, Lumber, or perhaps Nat Gas, throw all those three in there, you got a decent chance, one of them being at the top spot in either direction. Let's see how that holds out for this week as well. Number three, our old friend Oats off about five and a half percent. It was number four in the other direction last week, up six and about six and three quarters percent. Again, before you ask Oats, again, not really a big options stalwart out there. Number two, Palladium. This one's been moving quite a bit. Of late, Palladium off nearly 15% again this week, 14.91%. It was number three in the same direction last week, off 16.84%. So just kind of a Palladium apocalypse, (laughs) say that five times fast, going on out there this week. And again, same deal before you ask, Palladium not exactly blowing the doors off from an options perspective out there as well. Number one to the dark side, it's the euro dollars. Now it's showing 27.3% on our graph. Again, I've talked to Nick before. Sometimes that's a bit of a moving target when it comes to trying to pin down a net percentage number for the euro dollars because there are so many moving parts to the euro dollars, which is why sometimes we see these extreme numbers for the euro dollars out there. But anyway, this week, 27.32. It was number one in the same direction last week, off 24.49%. Now, the rates are moving, whether it's off 25%. I'll leave that up to your interpretation out there, listeners. Number five, to the light side we go. Soybean oil up 3.05% after having a pretty hot and heavy week for the ags recently. This week, kind of a little bit quieter. Number four, gold. We haven't really spent a lot of time in gold. I think when Uncle Mike came on, we hit on a little bit of the old metals because he loves them. But outside of that, gold back in our movers and shakers report this week for the first time in some time, up about 3.27%. Number three, one of our frequent offenders, it's lumber, up a pretty quiet 3.86%. I'll give you a hint. Last week, it was number two in the same direction. It was up nearly 22%. That's more along the lines of what we come to expect from lumber, not roughly 4%. That's kind of a rounding error for lumber these days. Number two, our other frequent offender out there, it's nat gas, up 15.74%. It was number two in the other direction last week, off 19.62%. Again. Given all the global tumult going on in that region, I think we can all expect NatGas to be on this report for the foreseeable future this week. Number two to the upside. And what's number one? What could outpace lumber and NatGas this week? It's Lean Hogs. Our old friend Lean Hogs breaking back in to the top five, taking the top spot up 17.41%. So if you rope them in with the soybean oil, now you got a couple of eggs to maybe sink our teeth into. And lean hogs are actually doing a little bit more paper now than they used to back in the day. So it's a much more relevant option story than it used to be. Mr. Doctor, we got quite the representative sampling 
in our movers and shakers this week. We've got ags, we've got metals, we've got energy, we've got rates, we've got a little bit of crypto. What floats your boat? Where should we start our journey this week, sir? Oh, well, I, I was just uh, one market I wanted to comment on before I, before we go on the journey. All right. We can, uh, we can lumber. comment before we and journey. <laughs> uh, yeah, just kind of, well, it's just, you know, we've talked, I, th- I think we talk about lumber every time that I'm on here. And um, I, I was curious, I, I hadn't had a chance to check. They've been running me all over the place in the business school today. Lumber, uh, you, you may want to be taking the other side of that one because uh, new housing construction fell for the first time in four months. And uh, maybe the demand for lumber, it, it could either be nobody wants to start building a house because lumber's too expensive or maybe demand is softening for lumber. So even though it's been a really strong market to the upside, that might be something worth looking at on the downside. And then is, is a lean hog one that's got a really nice exercise regimen? I've never really. Exactly. They have a Peloton a subscription. Is. They're hitting the bike yep. and the treadmill twice a day. Very lean. Very, very sculpted. <laughs> yeah, I guess Peloton's in trouble. Pelotons are cheaper, so hogs can stay in shape. Exactly. For as See, well. there's people. These so. are the correlations people don't know about that we uncover on this show. The hidden correlation <laughs> between lean hogs getting leaner and Peloton also getting leaner right now as well. So kind of a twofer out there. All right, where should we start our journey? Let, let, <laughs> let's go to energy. Just you know, um, World War Three. Yeah. is bullish. Kind of hard, etc. Kind of hard so. to, to not start <laughs> there this week. All right, listeners, off to the world of energy we go. It's time to tap into the deep options well of black gold, Texas tea, nat gas, and more. It's time to talk energy. All right, everybody, welcome to the world of energy. You guys know where to go to find all these reports for yourselves in your hot little hands. Whenever the mood strikes you, 3 a.m. on Tuesday, you want to check your soybean oil? We got you covered. Seemegroup.com slash TWIFO, T-W-I-F-O, or slash TWIO, T-W-I-O. Both of those should get you to our fun little reports over there. And I think just because... It is, like I said, it is our number two light side this week, and it is still dominating the headlines out there. It's one half of the biggest geopolitical story right now, which is, of course, what's going on in Ukraine. A lot of that driven by the nat gas market. So, Mr. Rhodes, we shall start in nat gas first. What is lighting up your tape in this yet another crazy week for natural gas, sir? No, nothing other than just a, a, a big old spike up and a big old utility bill that I got at both my apartment in Indiana and my uh, home in Chicago uh, based on uh, it, those prices doing nothing but going up. Um, it does. I mean, and now I'm just I'm, I'm starting to pull up the skew and get a little bit of a, a, a flavor as to what the option traders are thinking. It looks like um well that my my feeling is uh maybe more upside from here nothing like buying high to, to sell higher yeah net gas options almost quite literally on fire this week listeners moving quite a bit out here this week how much paper going up in net gas well you know a decent week 300 something pretty active week of getting into the 400 plus thousand contracts right now eight hundred and seven thousand contracts on the tape in net gas listeners so they are lighting things up Quite literally out there in the nat gas market. And what's interesting right now, by the way, nat gas coming into showtime, 452. That's up almost 60 cents on a week, about 58 cents. That's about 14.7% just this week. So obviously the lion's share of that move of nearly 16% since our last show has come since the start of this week. And so we're hanging out right around the four half strike. That's kind of our at the money strike listeners. And nat gas kind of trading like an equity right now. By the way, go into that drop down listeners, go to energy. Go over to natural gas, and that's where we are beginning our journey this week. And I say that because we joke all the time when we look at doesn't matter what it is, the S&P 500, Russell, NASDAQ, they all, most of their paper is going out with one day to go. They're all in that front contract. Well, NatGas says, you know, hold my beer this week (laughs) because 25% almost of that 800,000 contracts is going away in about six days in that March contract that has six days to go. So that's a heck of a lot of paper out there. The vol on that contract is a 74. Again, it's got six days to go. So how much vol is really there versus gamma? That's open to debate. We're going to go a little bit farther out because right behind it came the uh, April contract that had about 22% of the paper. And that has 38, 39 days to go. So a little bit more meat on the bone 
for us to examine out there. That contract, that future, a little bit lower. That's at a 445 right now. Both of them still hovering around that four half strike, listeners. In terms of the vol on that April contract, a little bit saner, 53 and a quarter. That's still up about 3.2 points from this time last week. But you know, if you've been following NatGas, listening to this show for a while, you know that NatGas vol can get up to triple digits when it wants to. So NatGas can rock and roll right now. We're at about half of that, at about a 53 and change out there. Let's look at the old skew, see what's lighting it up out there as well. Last week, the puts were 4.9% cheap. No one really wanted to touch the puts, and that's even more the case this week. 5.4% cheap. So the puts getting a little bit cheaper. Last week, all the love was to the calls. They were 10.1% rich. So listeners, you're already paying a 53 at the money ball. You got to pay a 10% premium on top of that last week if you wanted to buy a 25 Delta call. This week, that premium has come in. It's down to 5.2%. So it's been pretty much cut in half out there. Still, so actually right now, they're, they're looking at kind of almost equidistant in terms of these about similar discount to the puts as there is bid to the calls. So that's kind of interesting out there. Interesting setups like collars out there, even though not quite as attractive as it was this time last week. The calls obviously coming in roughly 50% on their bid, but still leading the dance when it comes to that's where the action, that's where the premium is. In terms of the most active contract, what was the hot contract leading the dance out here in NatGas this week? It was those March 5s, listeners, so not the four halves. It was the fives doing 31,589 contracts. Uh, The big day is today, 11,000, almost 12,000 going up today. So we're rocking and rolling today, kind of coming off the heels of the headlines out there. It's been a little bit of a tumultuous week out there. Obviously, earlier in the week, listeners, we had Putin and Russia saying, oh, look at this great video we produced. We're we're not we're not building up. We're leaving that region. And then uh, everyone from the White House to NATO saying, yeah, not so much today. So that's probably why we're seeing a lot more paper on the tape out there today. Uh, most of that was opening all week. Obviously, we don't know today's, but opening on the five strike, given what we're seeing out there. Let's look at the skew really quickly on that March contract as well. That skew is still pretty bid. It was 14.2 percent bid to the calls last week, 12.2 percent bid this week so the calls still pretty bid so probably some opening buying still on these fives in march and then once we come off of those we go back out to the april contract and you know what listeners it's not all calls all the time there are some puts trading in particular the april three half puts hold the number two spot this week with twenty three thousand five hundred of these bad boys again Today being the big day, almost 10,000 going up today, 7,500 yesterday, slightly biased towards opening, so a lot of back and forth. And the same deal on Tuesday, about 3,500 back and forth there as well, about 3,000 on Monday, slightly closing there. So maybe some folks getting the heck out of Dodge on the puts on Monday. And then as we continue to rally, maybe some back and forth trading going on. Either way, back and forth action on the three half puts in April out here as well. I expected it to be more call dominated. There are some calls going up. But there are more puts than I would have expected. Number three, we got the six calls here also in that April contract. So six looking pretty optimistic. Again, the lion's share today, nearly 11,000 of the about 19,000 going up today, about 4,000 yesterday, 2,500 on Monday, 1,300 on Tuesday, mostly opening throughout the week. And uh, we don't know about today, obviously. If you want to get even more optimistic listeners, we can go out a little bit. We can go out to the June 7 strike. In fact, the 7 strike was active in May and June. Kind of interesting out there. Seven strikes across the board, about 10,000 going up in May, close to it, and about 8,000 going up in June. Obviously, this is not a normal season, but usually that seasonality, that bid for nat gas doesn't usually resound into the summer, at least here in the U.S., and we're seeing activity on the sevens all the way out past June to August. Sevens were trading this week. Sevens were trading in October there as well. Wow, a lot of action on the sevens <laughs> across the board. Look, that's the strike du jour this week. Six halves trading in November. Let's go out to Deese just for fun. Deese was the four put, so a little bit saner heads triumphing out there. Mr. Rhodes, what are your thoughts on kind of everything I just broke down and the fact that upside calls still trading hot and heavy all the way through till close to the end of the year, sir? Well, if you, you know, but kind of looking at the same numbers you were, but just kind of a slightly different perspective. If you look at the, at the next 10 expirations, um, the only one that, that the most active was in, was the puts was in, uh, was the April contracts. And then it's like all calls until you get out to December and then maybe puts once again. Uh, and a lot of way out of my, you know, I don't, I don't know how it normally works seasonally, 
But I severely doubt that if we backtracked um, 12 months or 24 months that we would uh, that we would say the next 10 expirations, uh, nine of them had calls as the most active contracts. You would I would assume through normal seasonality that we would we would expect to see a little put action throughout the summer. But that is not the case. And not only is it, you know, skewed to the call side, but upside call, you know, we're at 450. You're looking at, you know, seven strike calls. Yeah, sevens across the board. Five of the top ten, five of those ten expirations, the most actively traded contract is those seven calls. So, yeah, if you're looking at this uh, report for this week and you're thinking maybe there's going to be a near-term resolution in the Ukraine, this uh-uh. report might throw a little cold <laughs> water on that. <laughs> well, well, you know, this is the, – the, I'm, I'm going to put on my little, uh, you know – Backtrack to to a previous a previous job a couple of jobs ago where it was my job to uh, defend options and promote options. Talk about how great options are. Um, if you are betting on something like you know what's going to happen over in in you know in the, in Ukraine, we don't call it the Ukraine. If you're trying to bet on what's going to happen in Ukraine, um, you're probably more comfortable. Uh, buying a call option than buying a long futures contract, because you know with uh, with implied volatility around fifty percent going out, you know even going all the way out to uh, December or so, that implied volatility is really you know you you said seventy, but then it still remains pretty darn high the farther out you go. Um, I just don't. I, I these are the kind of things that you would want to play with an option instead of a future. And I'm going to quote a slightly different market, but it, this is going to make an awful lot of sense. Uh, a while back, when when you know, four or five years ago, when Bitcoin had one of those big legs up, um, Buffett was asked, I think maybe at one of his annual meetings, would you short Bitcoin? And he said, I wouldn't short it, but I'd buy puts on it. And a lot of people you know, scratched their head. Well, why would you buy puts instead of selling short? Well, because selling short, you've got you know a, a substantial or theoretically uh, unlimited loss there. Whereas if you buy puts, you know the most you can at least you know the most that you can lose. And I, I would say that's kind of the same thing, but in the opposite direction with something like natural gas, which is really being driven by news while we sleep every day. Yes, this is an active complex. And again, I know uh, the Rock Lobster was hinting maybe he thought we might see a resolution over the weekend to this crisis. The uh, the term structure and activity in that gas may speak to otherwise. Here, this is carrying out almost through the end of the year here, which is again uh, interesting. And if you like this complex, something you definitely need to be checking out. Speaking of complexes, Mister Rhodes, we got a lot to cover today, so let's keep on rolling. Maybe we'll hang our hat out there in the metals next. Werewolves beware. It's time to explore the options activity in silver, gold, and other shiny things. It's time to talk metals. All right, everybody. Welcome to the wonderful world of metals. Get out of that energy drop down. Again, there's enough action in a lot of these complexes, it seems like, today. We could spend the whole show on them, but I want to kind of get a nice representative sampling in for everyone out there. Uh, We haven't talked a deep dive into metals in a while, so get on into that drop down pop out of energy, go all the way down to the bottom to metals, listeners. Go over. We're going to hang out in the precious today. Going to start in gold because gold is, once again, uh, the king of the roost, at least lightening it up from an overall volume perspective and an action perspective as well. Number four on our movers and shakers this week, up three and a quarter percent and doing some decent paper right now. Almost 300,000 contracts going up in gold. That's, That's a pretty active week. We haven't seen numbers like that. In a little while out there, 277,000 to be precise. And gold kind of doing its best equity impersonation as well, because about a third of that paper is going out in the March contract that goes away in six days. So we got a lot of people slinging some gamma out here in gold, which again, hard to argue. It's moving again. You know, in fact, this week up 60, 61 handles or 3.3% just this week alone. So need some near dated paper in weeks like this. We're going to go a little bit farther out, listeners. We're going to go into the April contract that did about 25, about almost 26% of the paper this week. So that's where we're going to hang out there. The future, by the way, coming into showtime, listeners, 1902. So just north of the 1900 level. Are we going to threaten that 2000 level again? Everyone got pretty excited last time we got up there. Uh, This is a pretty good week for those folks. So the gold bugs out there think maybe something like that may be 
a foot. Just on our last show, we had Uncle Mike talking about silver, saying he didn't think silver was really selling that, that Russia was actually going to invade in Ukraine, given the price action. Gold may be telling a little bit of a different story out here. Of course, maybe you expected more if we were on the precipice of, of war in that region. Uh, in terms of action, like we said, 1900 track, pretty much the at-the-money strike. The vol out here in gold, gold never known for a robust amount of vol, but it's at about a 16 right now, 16.15. That front contract going away in, oh, about five days, that has an 18 vol, a little bit higher. And the, the vol up nearly three points this week, 2.88 points. That's nothing to sneeze at in gold. That's a huge move for gold vol. And in terms of skew, again, calls usually where the action is. This week, not so much. Last week, the puts 3.2% cheap. This week, getting cheaper. I should be getting more bid, 4.1% bid. So a bid coming in for the puts. Last week, the calls were 6.6% bid. So they had a premium for the at-the-money. That's what you usually expect in gold. This week, that has come in four points. That's 2.6. So the calls coming in, puts getting bid. That's more along the traditional type of movement you would expect as you kind of move up the skew curve in a product like this. So the call is coming in. Not a lot of love for the upside up here in gold, which is kind of interesting. In terms of the action, let's see. What was the most active contract out here this week? It was the March 1900s, listeners. So pretty much the at the money. Again, that's a, a strike that probably shouldn't surprise you. It was actually a close battle between the March 1900s doing 9,300 contracts this week. So it just barely takes the top spot out here this week, listeners. Uh, pretty active all week long, but today was the most active day. 4,700 today, 2,000 Wednesday, 1,500 on Monday, 1,000 on Tuesday. Kind of back and forth throughout most of the week. And then hot on its heels, right behind it, listeners, were the 17 half puts doing about 91, almost 9,200 this week. Again, the big day today, nearly 5,000, 4,800 today, uh, 2,800 on Monday. The rest kind of scattered throughout the week. So 17 half puts and the 1900 calls, interesting mix. 1900 is obviously going out uh, pretty quickly out here as well. Let's look really quickly. Any other big strikes coming across the radar here? Those seem to be the two big ones. Let's look really quickly as well. Whenever we're doing gold, we like to look a little bit farther out, right? Because that's where, shall we say, the interesting upside funky paper, the flies, the ratios, all that stuff tends to go a little bit farther out. Did we see any of that today or this week? No, but we did see action on the 2,000 strike, 2,000 calls, trading about 3,000 times. Most of that, 2,200 on Tuesday and all of that opening. Another almost 1,000 going up the next day also opening. So opening positioning on the 2,000s and then 1,500, the 2,200s trading today. All of these here. Actually, these are September. These are not even December. So September out here. So action to the upside. Mr. Rhodes, anything catching your eye in the world of the shiny stuff this week, sir? Yeah, those I I you got a lot of 2000 calls trading on the June expiration and a lot of 2000 calls trading on the set <clears throat> excuse me expiration as well. Um you said that the skews I mean I I think the skew is still uh, looking pretty darn bullish even if it's narrowed somewhat. Uh the out of the money calls are a lot more bid than the out of the money puts right now. And uh you tend to see uh a dramatic shift if we if, if we're expecting uh, a change in direction. It doesn't look like anybody is ch expecting a change in direction for gold right now. Uh, I assume part of it's this geopolitical thing that we're dealing with, uh, because although we're all supposed to believe that gold is supposed to be a great inflation hedge, it doesn't seem when inflation became the thing that it really did influence gold. It's more of the possible World War III that is influencing the price of gold. Yeah, you can argue the better inflation play was crypto than uh, gold over that period, right? Because crypto took off where gold kind of languished a bit out there. Definitely underperformed compared to what a lot of people had come to expect over time. And you know what else you expect, listeners? There's a deep dive into equity volatility when Mr. Rhodes joins us. So let's do that next. It's time to explore the volatility swings, skew changes, and hot options trades in your favorite indices. It's time to talk equities. All right, everybody. Welcome to the world of equities. Get out of that metals drop down, pop on into the equities. Then we'll see where we land from there. Before we do that, let's set the table from a vol perspective. And uh, the vol actually starting to tick up. After today's bit of a sell-off out there, listeners, RVX back up about two and a half handles to a little bit north of the 33 level, so still staying firmly in the 30s this week. RVX, of course, the VIX 
of the Russell 2000 listener, so small cap ball. Then uh, VIX itself at about a 26 and a half when we kicked off the show. Puts it up a little over three points, about 3.1 points from where it was this time last week. VIX, so the vol of vol at about a 128. That puts it actually down slightly about a point, so pretty much unched from where it was this time last week. Vol Q, so the at the money vol of the NASDAQ 100. A little bit shy of 30, 29 double when we kicked off the show. It's up three and a half points from where it was this time last week. That puts that VIX to RBX spread right around six and a half. That's a little bit tighter than it was last show, about two-thirds of a point tighter. Still wider than historically what we've come to expect out there. So interesting stuff afoot. And the VIX to vol Q widening out to about three points. It's about almost half a point wider. And for a while there, that VIX to vol Q, they were kind of hanging out at the same level, which was a little bit weird. So that, that spread was non-existent, now widening back out to about three points. Mr. Rose, anything catching your eye in the world of equity volatility these days, sir? You know, you know the oh. thing you've, you've written one or two books about. Yeah, something something I like to pay attention to a lot. Uh, one thing is the um, the VIX vol Q thing seasonally, it, and I've spoken about this in a few other places. Seasonally, uh, the weakest months of the year, or the weakest time period of the year for vol Q versus VIX uh, is February and March. And uh, we haven't, I, I don't, I, I haven't watched it from moment to moment, but I do not recall uh, vol Q falling to a discount to VIX yet in February. Uh, normally, half the days in February, vol Q's at a discount. And it's usually uh, just a, a falling off of the implied volatility of the big NASDAQ 100 components uh, causes vol Q to, to kind of fall under VIX. I think maybe the inflationary environment that is considered more negative for technology stocks than and possible economic slowing, which would also be more negative for technology stocks, is probably keeping NASDAQ 100 at the money implied volatility higher than the strip of SPX implied volatility, which is uh, a roundabout way of, of throwing the difference between the vol Q and the VIX calculations in there. Uh, the one that, that really catches my eye is that RVX VIX relationship right now with RVX still at such a premium. And if I recall correctly, I believe that the Russell 2000 did not have nearly as bad a week as the other broad-based indexes. Last week, and and I felt like RVX should be getting back, you know, narrowing that spread to a more historical norm. Uh, part of it may be with RVX. Uh, it, may, it might be the call side of the strip that's that's helping that stay up. Uh, I, I pulled up the uh, the Twifo page and I was looking at the out of the money call versus out of the money put implied volatility for Russell 2000 options, and there's not a big difference there. You know, the, like a couple of points or so, not a, not a big difference at all. So it's looking more like a smile for the Russell 2000 implied volatility than the, the skew that we expect out of equity index implied volatility. And that, that's been happening periodically uh, as people have some sort of a fear of missing out small caps trade. And I think they try to make up for it by buying calls. Indeed, sir. Let's break it all down here on the show. By the way, I've often used that analogy because you're right. You know, you can't really directly compare the VIX to the ball Q because a little bit different methodology. You can't really say they're apples to oranges either because they are different flavors. So I, I often use the Macintosh to golden delicious analogy. What do you think of that? Matt, what is a golden delicious? Apple. These are apples. So instead of saying oh, they're apples, apples to oranges, it's an apple to a different type of apple. That's what I'm saying. That is, a, that, that, that is two very different type of apples. I have lost you apparently here. And How about them apples? You get into the lands of fruits and Dr. Vix's, Dr. Vix's education just falls off a cliff there. Vol, he's got it. Apple types, not so much. So let's see what's lighting it up out there. Since you mentioned all things small caps, uh, small caps... You're right. Looking a little bit robust this week compared to everything else out there. North of the 2000 level again, 2028, uh, still up on the week, up about almost three points on the week. That's better than giving up, you know, 30 or 50 points out there over the course of the week. So small caps, you're right, holding up. We we're just talking about uh, the IWM flavor on our show an hour or so ago, and that ADV is back up to north of a million again. So we're seeing action out there in all things small caps as they were for a while, they're kind of the the bellwether, the canary in the coal mine. They were getting into correction before everything else. They were rallying out of it before everything else. So they're very much leading the curve out there when it came to equities. And as you would expect, a pretty active week. Again, by the way, about 26, 27,000 contracts on the tape right now in all things small caps. And of that out there in Rutland, 
as you would expect, about 40% <laughs> going the way of the Dodo tomorrow. Let's go a little bit farther out really quickly to see where we can find a little bit more action to hang ourselves. Now let's go out to the end of month. Actually, let's go out to the monthly March because that's only about 20. That's about 26 and a half percent of the paper. Uh, the vol out there, if you're wondering, listeners, a little bit shy of a 30, 29.92. So just a few points below where we're seeing in that RVX. Remember, RVX is not just a straight at the money vol measure, as, as Russell mentioned. It includes some skew in there, which is why that that number is going to be a little bit different, even if we go out 30 days in the options in terms of the skew the puts are still bidding about the same level they were last week this week they're 17.8 percent bid last week 17.5 percent and the calls last week were cheap 14.3 percent cheap this week they're even cheaper 15.7 percent so uh puts staying firm calls getting a little bit lighter out there in the small caps and in terms of where the action was it was march 22 15 calls that were leading the dance. So again, people always fixate on these fairly small Delta calls. And these are, they have about a month to go. They're not huge Delta. That's for sure. Uh, 2215. That's a bit of a ways out list. It's not quite 200 points, but it's pretty darn close uh, out of the money here. These have been trading pretty actively all week. Actually, the big day was Tuesday. looks like someone took off about a thousand of them on Tuesday. So maybe a little bit of a closing of these, shall we say, very optimistic <laughs> strikes also saw about a thousand of the 2195s going off that same day also closing so maybe taking off a bit of a vertical about a 20 point vertical or perhaps just taking off parts of a of a strip they had out there either way small delta calls being closed out here so everyone who keeps asking about those there's your small delta call report out there in the russell 2000 in terms of what's going away tomorrow it looks like it's the 2000 puts that were pretty active out here this week as well, leading the dance. Not surprising, that is the at-the-money strike. Uh, Mr. Rhodes, I know you got to teach some kitties over there over there in Indiana as well. So anything else catching your eye in the land of equities? And also, we got time for probably one more complex. What else should we squeeze in after the equity? So I'll, I'll give we you got, dealer's choice. Time for another complex. Uh, just looking at those March options, uh, it's uh, it's interesting. You said it looks like they they're they're – Taking those 2215s off, I think they're I think they're definitely selling them uh, because you're you, you're just you, you see a little bit lower out of the money call implied ball for that line versus some of the other ones. So that 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 one option there might be uh might might be pushing that you know pushing the the out of the money call line down just a little bit relative to the put line. Uh, so I think those 2215s are 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 not they're they're not holding on to that lottery ticket for much longer apparently. Um, otherwise, it's it's just kind of a real mix here. I I would have expected looking at the skew that uh, we'd had a lot of active you know on each line we would have seen the calls more active than the puts or the out of money calls more active than the puts. It's really kind of a mix. So and I think that's about how everybody feels about stocks these days. Uh, let's toss a coin and go long or short because I got no clue. <laughs> um, are, are you giving me free reign? On the I'm giving you free reign. You or... can choose whatever you want. We had a couple of votes in the chats for rates. We can go there. Or we can go somewhere let's go, else. Let's, ags. Go to, let's go to rates just because of the euro dollar move. All and, right. and I know I brought up rates before when not a lot's going on, but I do think it makes sense this time. It does make sense this time as we head on into the world of rates. The Fed, the yield curve, inflation fears. How are they impacting options activity and volatility in your favorite interest rate products? Let's find out as we explore the world of rates. All right, buddy. Welcome to the world of rates. Go into that drop down, pop out of equities and go down two slots to interest rates. And then maybe we'll hang out in the euro dollars. Maybe we'll move somewhere else. We have been doing a lot of deep dives into rates. If you like rates, check out last week's show. Uh, we had a great deep dive over there the week before we did. We've done a lot of rates of late, which kind of speaks to where we are in the cycle right now, listeners. The Fed suddenly hot again, rates suddenly hot again. And hence, they are on the show again. Mr. Rhodes, we haven't checked in with you really since uh, all this Fed madness started popping off. But what's catching your eye out there in the broad macro world as well as in the world of rates? Well, in the broad in the broad macro world, that uh, we we hit a we hit the the possibility that we're going to see a fifty basis point increase at the March meeting, and that eased right back off, uh, and, and which is very surprising to me because usually uh, once the uh, once the futures markets change 
and indicate something different. And a week ago, it said it was a 93.8% chance we were going to get a 50 basis point hike next time around. That's already come down to 32.7%. Uh, this would be the first time that the probability got over 60% uh, for some sort of change and then fell under and it didn't end up coming to fruition. So maybe even the probability markets, which have been very accurate in the past, are starting to uh, starting to give in to all the goofiness of trying to figure out what's going on in the world. Speaking of trying to figure out what's going on, let's try to figure out what's going on in this freaking Euro dollars curve, listeners. There's, there's so much of foot here. We could spend a whole show just digging into it. Is it pretty active again this week? The answer is yes. 4.3 million contracts on the tape right now, listeners. So that's a little bit of paper. And of that, unlike the equities, which it all goes away tomorrow, Euro dollars tend to spread their reach far and wide. In this case, listeners, about 24%. So the most active contract is in uh, the June contract, the front June contract there going out in about 115 days. So pretty active paper out there. What's, what's the vol, you might ask, in said contract? Again, everyone thinks of rates. They think, yeah, you know, the 10-year, a 6, a 4, a 9. <laughs> you know, these are the vols you're used to. Uh, 84.3. <laughs> in the June Euro dollar contract. It's off 35 points from this time last week. So some of these metrics are kind of just off the charts out here in, in rates land and Euro dollars land this week, listeners. In terms of the skew, uh, we have a little bit of the old equity skew shaping up out here. Last week, the puts were pretty bid, almost 8% bid. Coming in a little bit this week, 6.7% bid. The calls last week, 10.8% cheap this week, getting cheaper off to 11.6%. And what was the hot contract, the most active bit of business out here in the Euro dollars this week? Well, again, I love the old, the old teenies and eighths. It kind of brings me back to my early days in the business, listeners. Uh, the nine, <laughs> 98 and 5 eighths puts. It just brings a smile to my face, listeners. Going up 136,355 times. Uh, the big day, not today, actually Tuesday, 35,600. Of those bad boys. Actually, I take it back Monday, 63,600 going up on Monday. Most of that opening. Tuesday, 35,600. Again, most of that opening. Uh, today, about 24,000. Wednesday, about 13,000. So opening throughout the week. So a good chance we got some opening paper again today. So 98 and 5 eighths leading the dance out here pretty aggressively. Let's look really quickly and see if anything else is, is really catching up to that. No, it seems like the next closest... Next closest is the 98 half put again in that same contract. Had about 96,000 contracts going up, uh, 61,000 going up on Monday. So maybe a bit of a, a vertical going up on Monday or maybe even a fly because uh, 61,000 of the 98 half puts and also 32,000 of the 98 and 5 sixteenths. Good times out there. So we got 32,000 by 61,000. So 32 by 61 by 64,000 on Monday. So it's a pretty tight vertical. But then again, we've seen crazier things out there. And if it was a fly, it's a pretty tight fly as well. Uh, Mr. Rhodes, crazy paper out here, crazy vol, crazy action as you are wont to expect in the euro dollars. What's lighting up your tape in the world of the euro dollars this week, sir? Uh, I, I've got a new, uh, a, a new 80s band name for you. Flipping Skew. Oh. Okay. If you look at the skew, it do well in uh, Chicago, I think. Maybe not anywhere they else. They would do flipping skew. Nah. So, but if you uh, yeah, if you start looking down this euro dollar board, uh, you've got uh, calls bid, calls bid, calls bid, <gasps> puts bid, and that switches from. And and I'm talking about the calls are are have higher implied volatility. Uh, with, I'm not going to count March because it's pretty much flat there. But uh, April, May, June. And then when you get to July, the, uh, the it just completely flips around, and you know, and and I'm not talking about by like a point or two. Uh, the, uh, the the out of the money calls are 10.8 percent. The out of money puts are 7.8 percent. With the June contract, when you go to July, the puts are 12.1, and the calls are 7.3. I mean that that that's not like a you know you put those two lines on a chart together, it looks like. Uh, where we're you know just trying to find an optimal crossover or something they they don't they don't even look like they're from the same market they do not indeed sir mm -hmm. interesting stuff i'm looking at the chat here we have uh, a bunch of people talking about trading futures here and rates 
And uh, <laughs> Luigi wants to know if he missed you talking about black gold. We didn't get into black gold today. We got more into the, I don't know if you can call it nat gas, so a what is, colorless gold, I guess you can call I, it. Yeah. <laughs> Doesn't really it's have like a color. moonshine. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it, it looks just like PGA. I wish we could get into more, but uh, we cannot keep the once and future and indeed present Vix, present Vix, present Dr. Vix from his educational duties over there in the realm of Indiana. All right, Mr. Rose, that music means we're coming up against that. I know you got to run to go teach, whip out that pointer, get the chalk dust on you, whatever it is you do over there when you're teaching these days. But before we go, sir, if you want to leave our audience with any thoughts, any interesting areas that are catching your eye, maybe any areas that are worthy of note that you're watching across any of these complexes, now is the time, sir. The floor is yours. You know, the, the equity space, um, uh, th- there seems to be fundamental concern about the small caps, but I re- and it's not just because I'm on the FTSE Russell hot seat. Uh, I do feel that uh, from this point on, probably through the end of the year, that, that this is going to be small caps year. I really do. I think, uh, I, and I think you see it in some of the paper that we were talking about as well. Uh, they, they underperform. They're the only ones that have put in that 20% correction. Uh, among the three big equity indexes, the, the S&Ps, the, NAS, the NASDAQ 100, and the Russell 2000. And ever since they hit that down 20%, we've, we've seen some really nice catch up. There's also a bit more of a value bent to the Russell 2000 than those two other indexes. And that's probably the kind of stocks that are going to hold up in the environment that we're going to endure through 2022. There you go, listeners. Mr. Rhodes was pretty prescient on his early Santa Claus rally there in the small caps. And we did see that for a while until, of course, the legs got cut out from any everything, really, in the equities world with the Omicron stuff. Then small caps led the dance out there. Will they lead the dance again? Interesting stuff. Something to keep an eye on out there. Looks like more and more of you are keeping an eye on all things small caps because they are an interesting one to watch. They do kind of act as a bellwether for the other major indices a lot these days. So something to keep an eye on there. You know where to go to keep an eye on all of these reports and a whole bunch more cmegroup.com slash twifo is the place to go for these reports you can run them whenever you want till your heart's content and of course footsierussell.com f-t-s-e russell.com is the place to go to learn more about all this small cap stuff that russell was just talking about in a lot more detail so of course we're talking about the skew the volatility the impact of covid recon coming up there and the not so distant future. So, we're gonna be talking about that, the readjustments. Is Russell 2000 really a good leading indicator for the rest of the indices? They have research on all that and a whole bunch more. FTSE Russell.com is the place to go. Give them a follow on the old Twitters as well, at FTSE Russell. All one word. We gotta get on out of here, listeners, but we'll be back again tomorrow. Don't you worry. Noon Central, 1 p.m. Eastern for the old volatility views. Coming hot on his heels after that by Options Oddities. Got to be my favorite show on the network right now. Certainly very fun. It's also expensive for me a lot these days. Got to put on a lot of positions. But it's fun. We like doing it for you folks out there. So you can join us there tomorrow. Options Oddities. If you haven't joined the Secret Club yet, theoptionsinsider.com. Slash Secret Club is the place to go to learn more off on Monday, of course, next week for the President's Day holiday here in the U.S. But we're back again next Thursday. Another episode of This Week in Futures Options. Stay safe out there, everybody. This Week in Futures Options is brought to you by CME Group, the world's leading and most diverse futures and options exchange. CME Group's markets help individuals and businesses around the world manage risks and seize opportunities. CME Group offers the deepest and most liquid options on futures across all asset classes, including interest rates, equity indexes, foreign exchange, energy, agriculture, and metals. For more information and educational resources about futures options at CME Group, visit cmegroup.com slash 
Options. This Week in Futures Options is also brought to you by FTSE Russell, a leading global provider of benchmarks, analytics, and data solutions. Investors in the U.S. and around the world are using FTSE Russell indexes to benchmark their investment performance and create investment funds, ETFs, structured products, and index-based derivatives. Many Options Insider Radio Network listeners will be familiar with the Russell 2000 Index. Russell 2000 Futures and Options are currently trading on the Chicago Board Options Exchange and CME Group. For more information, please visit FTSERussell.com, CBOE.com, and CMEGroup.com. This broadcast is intended for informational and educational purposes only and does not constitute trading advice or the solicitation of purchases or sale of any futures or options. The rulebook of the applicable exchange should be consulted as the authoritative source on all current contract specifications. You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available in the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. <laughs> 